I openly talk about sex because I think a lot of women don't in the right ways. I think we like teach kids about like sex ed and we do all the things and like, okay, great. But we actually don't talk about like the underneath of it all. We kind of shame the like the desire, the presence, the like the actual things that happen within your own body that no one else gets to define but you. And I spent a lot of time and space being something I wasn't really. Like I jokingly have said, like, I don't know if there's a, a partner I've been with minus my wife. And I mean that holistic, like wholeheartedly. I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> that I haven't faked. I haven't faked an orgasm. I haven't like faked my way through it because that was an agreement I made with myself when kind of before you and I even got together was like, I'm done doing that. Cause there's no, there's like this essence of like space for women, particularly in our like social constructs to be like, oh, our partner has to be happy. And the only way to be happy is if I have an orgasm or if I have this space. And the guilt that comes with that. And the guilt that comes with that. And then, you know, so it's this whole thing. It like puts you into your head, which is like not the space for intimacy at all. Welcome to the Relationship Psychologist Podcast. Tune in every Thursday to learn with us as we interview experts. And laugh with us as we banter about friendship. And take action by implementing the tools and advice we provide to you each week to level up your personal relationships. I'm Dana Mullen. And I'm Alicia Hinger. We are soul sisters, besties, and psychologists on a mission to change the culture of relationships. Your journey to becoming more supported and connected starts right right now. now. Welcome to the podcast. Megan and Erin. Woohoo! In the house. Kind of. Oh. Hi. In your house. (laughs) <laughs> not in my house not in dana's house in the house no need these questions okay so normally we introduce our guests um but because you're a couple and you're our first other than stan and tracy i guess who's our first couple you're our second couple we want to have you guys introduce each other because we do this with our couples in our offices and in our workshops and it's really fun and cute so put you on the spot so aaron introduced megan and megan introduced aaron Okay. However you want, in a way that like, we want you to fill each other up, in a way that fills up your bubbles, it fills up your your bucket. Our buckets. Okay. This is Megan. Okay. Soon to be Megan will show doesn't change her name yet. But oh. Megan, you are, she's a financial advisor here in Lethbridge. Um, her kind of MO and what I always say, she has slogans that she wants to, I said, we got to put that on a t-shirt. Uh, her biggest one is celebrate the wins. So her mm-hmm. MO's life and to her business and practice is to find solutions financially for people to get to where they want to go, meet their kind of goals, whether that's retirement or savings, education, that kind of thing. She's brilliant at her job. She's very good at it. Um, She also is an absolute brain. She had a full ride scholarship to a D1, uh, I was going to say high school, geez, college, um, to Syracuse University, where she graduated in 2012? Yep. 2012 uh, with a bachelor's of science in biology with a minor in women's studies. Yeah, women and gender studies. Nailed it. Um, And then played hockey. She was a absolute stunner of a hockey player uh we grew up playing midget triple a together which unbeknownst to us would turn into how we know each other for half of our lifetime and now become my wife which is pretty amazing um she's the oldest of three she's a middle her middle sibling is a brother Lyndon, and then her youngest sibling is Bryn. she's fiercely loyal and absolutely an epic glue to her family you're welcome. It's my jokes. Oh. Um, oh. It's... Making me blush. <laughs> um, what else can... Who else are you? We co-head coach Top 40. Here. Yeah, we co-head coach together. So we coach a junior, a female hockey team here in Lethbridge, which is U22. Um, that's kind of been our baby for the last, like, three years for Megan. It's been hers for six. Yeah, going on the sixth season. Um, yeah, it takes up a lot of our damn time but we love it they're like our we have like 21 teenage kids for seven months of the year which is a blast um that's yeah that's megan amazing (laughs) amazing welcome megan we already love you you've done lots (laughs) people have to know i have no problem really great intro megan (laughs) that was a really cash intro absolutely yeah welcome perfect well, now that I'll follow that, um, obviously, 
Karen. This is my wife. Um, more importantly, she is a practicum counseling student with you under you, Alicia, as a supervisor. Um, you're pretty much a badass in that arena. So you've done a lot of work in disability and, of course, doing a lot of work in addictions counts counseling and um being in some treatment centers and arenas that like has allowed you to be in this space authentically and with value which is pretty exciting to see she pretty much always has her counseling hat on i say that um she told the players yesterday that she was taking her coaching hat That's off and putting her like psychologist hat on i said the psychologist hat is always on even in our relationship um but it adds extreme value to all of her friends and family and she is a giver constantly even when sometimes her cup is not full. So that's pretty important. She's the youngest and youngest by nine years of the oldest child. Mm -hmm. Three girls, um, a very fierce and loyal father who oversees the household. Mm -hmm. They share a love of hockey and her other two sisters figure skated. So a little bit of a close bond in that arena. And more than anything, um, honestly, just fiercely loyal, super, super intelligent, made me fall in love with her has a smart, smart brain. Um, and more importantly, I get to come along for the ride. So obviously psychology degree, done a lot of work, but I can't summarize it all in one, one kind of blurb. Aww. Well done. You guys rock that. It's so good. And we should record that as like, okay, so when we introduce couples, do it like this, do it like these two just did, because that was really good. <laughs> It was so good. I love, oh, I just love, I like, what a great way to introduce um, each other. You guys are seriously such a cute couple already. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So true. I know you dive into all the hard stuff. Start with all the cute stuff, and then we'll dive into like the windy road, right? That got you to be as brilliant and as amazing as you are as a couple, power couple now, but there didn't, wasn't always that easy to get to this space. So can we go like, can we start there? Can we start like back at the windiest spots? Um, her wants to start first. I obviously, I know Erin's story more than I know Megan is I talk to Erin every day. So I'm always picking her brain and random stuff comes up in sessions. And she's like, oh yeah, this relates to this. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious about Megan's story too, about, you know, playing hockey and the family dynamics and the whole idea of like, so, okay. So my sister, I asked my sister this the other day, I mean, Erin knows this, we talked on the phone, me and Annie, and I was like, you should come on the podcast and help us talk about, you know, what it was like, you know, as a kid and being married to a woman. And she was like, I'm not gay married. I'm just married. There's no like <laughs> process for me. I'm like, I know. So that was her experience. There was no like big, wear what you want to wear, dress what you want to dress, love you want to love. So that's kind of our experience of it. So just not everyone's experience, obviously. So I'm grateful that you guys are going to come here and explain a different experience because Annie's was a very lovely experience I think in most most ways which not everybody gets so who wants to start with their I have lots of questions for both of you so whoever wants to start oh geez okay well I'll go first I'll let then bacon get warmed up um oh. it was it's been interesting for me um majority of the time for me I think in my like late I guess like late twenties, mid to late twenties was kind of when I started to understand more of authentically who I was. And before that, I spent a lot of my time kind of following the yellow brick road, if that makes sense. So I fell in, I just was like, okay, like this is what happens. This is what I do. Um, so I was, I met my, I was married before Megan. So I was married to a man. Uh, I met him when I was about 15 um, and then we were together since then. Megan actually knew him. The ongoing joke is when we played hockey together at the rookie party, they had a few too many and I think shared a toilet, a toilet together. <laughs> or man joke. You're like, I'll marry both of those two eventually. Yeah, you get there. <laughs> it was just like the inception uh, moment of comic relief. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, when I was 25, uh, I kind of came out to my family, um, said I was going to get a divorce, said that this was part of me that I wanted to kind of explore. Um, at that time, there was a space where I needed to take that moment. So we separated and tried to sort through it and all that kind of stuff. And my family took it hard, I think. Uh, Carson was a large part of my life for a long time and was a kind of a brother to my siblings and you know a son to my dad and to my mom uh, so that space of grief took me a long time to kind of understand so for me that would probably be the windiest road to get to where I am now was learning not necessarily that me coming out or kind of telling my parents that I was getting divorced 
that part was kind of fine. That was like me stepping into myself, but to have that space to understand that that grief for them wasn't necessarily about me being gay, but kind of letting go of a relationship that no longer would exist. Yeah. And then also learning who I was as a new human, yeah. when you kind of step into yourself and kind of unveil this big piece of you, it's like, oh, wow. Okay. I just like lean forward into something instead of kind of like itch my way in it or kind of lean sideways to hope that I kind of like catch a glimpse of it every now and again. So that took a while. There's a lot of, I have, yeah, like resentment. There's a lot of like, not an animosity is a little strong word, but like there's a lot of space there that I went, I don't know how my family and I'll kind of move through this space together. Um, because so. was that, Aaron, because of your leaning sideways behaviors or is that because of their grief? I think a little bit of both. Um, I think there was a, a very large part of me that struggled to lean completely into saying like, I'm, I'm a gay woman or like I, my preference of a partner is a woman. And that was confusing. Like I labeled myself as bisexual because it wouldn't make sense to me if like I was married to a man and was with him for over a decade. And then all of a sudden be like, Oh, I only like women that to me in my head, it didn't conceptualize the right way. So I, that's what I labeled myself. I said, I'm bi and I, I want to go explore this side or part of me. And that made it confusing, I think, for my family. That was really tough. And almost for myself. I think that was a really difficult mm. thing. So when I started to own that space, I could, again, my relationships with my family just kind of like, I didn't take a backseat, but I really took a space of being like, I need to go and honor who I am and like where I want to be. Um, and that took a while. I felt alienated a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. So just kind of pushed them away, um, to try and figure out who I was and where I wanted to go. And a couple handful of toxic relationships and a few broken hearts and some bad emotional turmoil I put myself through. Um, I found myself in a place when Megan and I connected that it was, I was okay with where I was and there was so much. <laughs> sense of loss for me in a lot of ways because I followed the yellow brick road. Right. So it was like, Oh, like I got married. I had the house. I had the dog. We were just about to start like, you know, having kids, you know, cause I was 25 and I was going to have three kids by the time I was 30. Right. Right. Wow. The right. Like that was boxes. No kids. Right? All those, yeah. All those boxes. Like I just I love hearing you say the idea of like, I put myself on these boxes, the yellow brick road. I had to go in the box because it's what you do. And so I'm in this box, even though the box isn't, I'm like squishing myself in this box. It doesn't really fit. And I kind of knew it from a probably younger age. And then even as you come out of the box, you're like, I still can't fully be out of the box because there's these labels that we love. And so I'll be by instead of just being full on lesbian or gay, or whatever, like, the, all these boxes, all these rigid labels, like that kept you stuck. Ugh. Yeah. So it was this, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was, a, it was really like, I look back at it now. I'm like, oh man, like, I wish I had it like recorded to like watch myself go through like all these paces. But I think oh. not right. I wouldn't go through it again though. <laughs> it could be good. It could be a horror movie, yeah. but we survived. You know, we always joke that like Hallmark eventually, right? There's like some yeah. cute thing at the, at the end, the pinnacle that happens. But yeah, through it, I was like, true. this is a wow. lot. Yeah. So yeah, I think when I decided to honor myself and I stepped into space with Megan, it was kind of like, okay, like this will be what it is. And I'll either like, I'll either have kids or I won't. I will either be married or I won't. And I'm okay with that because I'm not willing. Mm. Yeah. Right. To kind wow. of give the shit. Like, I don't want, I'm not willing to have that in my life anymore. Um, and Megan will yeah. tell a bit of her story, but um, it was when we started talking and kind of like setting up, I was at the time on a contract in Grand Prairie and <laughs> was coming to Lethbridge to actually get tattooed. And we had seen each other every like, I don't know, a handful of months. We'd like, Hey, like, how's it going? I'm going to like, I'll be in town. Let's grab a beer, you know, have a glass of wine. Not best friends, but people that just, just get kept in touch. Stay in touch. Cause we'd known each other since we were 16 years old. So we were setting at time and I had kind of messaged and she had said, Oh, you know, she said, how's like dating life just kind of randomly. And I was like, well, oh, it's whatever. She goes, how's your dad about it? And I was like, he's fine. I think I don't really know. Like I haven't really brought anyone home. So it doesn't really matter. And she goes, Oh, he just needs someone to, what did you say? Has it, he needs someone who can talk hockey with. Yeah. He's got to talk hockey with. 
and like slyly was like <laughs> by the way that was not in plant for me by the way. <laughs> so that was <laughs> plant. yeah right so fast forward a couple of weeks later when I'm in town and one thing led to another and then we I was just kind of like hey like if this is just a thing like it's fine I like I don't need to date you I still love you as a friend and like I always have and can let it be and after a, an interesting weekend and driving home back to Grand Prairie she was like no like it's not just a thing like we're dating and I was delete like, your dating apps okay <laughs> I guess we're in it now so went back to Grand Prairie finished that contract and that was yeah it's been some physical like I, my body struggled when I was not in a space and hence why, you know, I was telling this to Megan after a women's retreat the other weekend was like, it's fascinating to me that like how I operate in the world. And when I allow those things to come for me, that the universe aligns, whether that's like spirit, God, universe, whatever you believe in has aligned for me to say like the right people will come at the right time. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me four years ago, one-to-one counseling was like not what I wanted to do in a thousand years. Like not, I was like, no, thank you. I don't want to, I want to stay corporate. I want to work with like businesses and do program development and management. That's where my stick is. I'll stay. And then as like all the things aligned, which I actually met Alicia when I was planning to propose to Megan. So that kind of lined and I had lied to Megan and was like, yeah, I'm going to go talk to Alicia about being my supervisor. Which I'm like, that's a great idea. I was like, actually, was like, I have no idea what the F I'm going to do, but it's fine. This will work. And Alicia was like, off the cuff. She was like, how did you tell her you were coming here? And I was like, I told her that I was going to actually be my supervisor for this program. And Alicia was like, well, yeah, no shit. Go get the program done. and It'll be fine. And I was like, well, okay, <laughs> here we are. But then meeting Alicia... And going like how you operate in the world and how you, your philosophy and approach to not only your clinical setting, but your personal setting of how your mind and body have this really close, beautiful connection. And if you don't pay attention to it, it'll tell you, it'll start to scream at you. And many times throughout my life, my body has said, what the fuck are you doing? Like, figure it out, let go, release, do things. So that's been a really amazing part of my journey, my body working against me many times to say get in check um yeah so really the adjustment in the curvy road for me was my family a thing in relationships yes friendships relationships it took a windy turdy road as I was learning myself but I would say my biggest one was my my body my mind body connection and how that operated in space for me and just when you just listen to it the kind of harmony that happens which was pretty cool amazing yeah. Like a thousand more questions about that, but I want to give Megan a chance. But just Dana, we'll take a note about going back to the body connection. And even I love the idea of like getting rid of all those boxes and just honoring your authentic self. That you just you said it very lightly, but that's not a light thing to do. You're like, oh, I just did this thing. I'm like, yeah, but that's like all in deep dive, like that's messy, it's hard. Mm-hmm. And then you say, like, it's just this thing. I just did it, and here I am, which is amazing. So mm-hmm. we're gonna circle back to that. Parking lot. Just got in the parking lot. Right, eloquently spoken. Yeah. Your turn. Yes. Uh, you can tell Windy Road. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little different. Mm. <laughs> a little different. And not good or bad otherwise. I think everyone's, you know, space is super unique. And I think the important thing is just like finding out how to get through it in a way that like moves you forward. Right. So um when I went off to New York, like I definitely wouldn't have said I was gay. Um, you know. I might have had an inkling in some regard, but like whether that was allowed inkling or not allowed inkling, you know, would be to be determined. I grew up for sure Christian, like we didn't go to church every day, but I grew up in Southern Alberta. I grew up very black and white thinker. You can ask Aaron, I'm still fairly black and white. It's really hard for me to get out of those boxes. So there's a right way to do something. There's a wrong way to do something. So it's really hard for my brain, um, you know, in a lot of arenas to like live in gray. So leaving and going to New York obviously was a blessing because I got an opportunity to just like challenge the way I think and be in a different space um, without the impact of of having everyone I know close to me here um, be there and obviously that transition into like me having a relationship um, at the end of my freshman year which obviously blew up maybe not obvious you wouldn't know that but you know she'd come to visit the first summer I'd come back I knew my parents would not be supportive. I knew that it would be a thing and I didn't judge them for it. It was just kind of a fact. 
And I mean, a lot of people struggle with that. They have their belief system. They have the way they've grown up. You've got your culture, your community, all the things that can, you know, conflict into one arena. And of course it, it, it did blow up. Um, it did blow up, not intentionally. Um, but to the point where like, you know, it was not a positive place to be. It was a pretty toxic relationship. I think they probably would agree to that. Um, and there was a lot of fighting. So, you know, obviously I finished out my four year degree. I hung out in New Jersey for a couple of months after to like prepare myself to come back. Um, Eat some really good food. Yeah, primarily I'm a foodie. So you go to New York, you just love pasta, you love pizza. Like that's the biggest thing I miss about being there. But, you know, it's been a really tough um, grind to kind of conflict my own beliefs, um, the way I was raised with, you know, what is right or wrong. Unfortunately or fortunately, like, Religion is very much fear-based. Um, not always. It doesn't have to be, but definitely like the the definition of going to hell or all of the things that come with it can be really hard to grapple, not only for your family, but for yourself. So I wouldn't say I've grappled it all the time. That's not something I'm gonna like pretend to to obviously sit in. But you know, it has been a constant battle of like, okay, going to counseling, you know, I don't have any boundaries. What are boundaries? How do I have those tough conversations and find a place? Can we coexist in a space that like you can honor, respect me? Um, and then I also can show up in space. So my biggest thing I've, you know, kind of taken away over the last couple of years is like, I show up angry, show up defensive because I like just enter into a space in which even if, you know, I was having a conversation with my parents and they were really genuinely interested or wanted to know how things were doing. Like I just wasn't in a place to be able to have those conversations without feeling triggered. So it's been a super hard, hard thing to work through. Um, I love my family dearly. Wouldn't change it for the world to be completely frank. And they definitely made me who I am. So it's like, you're great. You're grateful for the struggle. I never say that everything happens for a reason, but there's joy in every storm. So like my, my joy is that like I know I'm a tough person like <laughs> I think there's a lot of tough people so you know and I get to take that experience and use it with other people I get to like have empathy um and I have a lot of empathy for people like I always say like if you tell someone you're gay we don't expect a parade <laughs> we understand it's a harder life it'd be cool but you know like I get that you have an ideal or you're like hey like I was really excited my little girl like I'm gonna have a you know a brother-in-law for my son or you know I'm gonna have a you know a son-in-law I'm like we get that like we're pretty human we're we're pretty raw we're pretty real so I've never expected like this celebration there's a mourning whether it's like you're in a relationship you break up you're mourning that future you never had with that person it's the same thing with your kids right there's a there's a grieving process there's a human process and then you know can we move through it because that's to me the question is like can we move through it can we change can we evolve because like we can all be human that like it's not not the easiest day every day but I love you I wouldn't change that and but like we're pretty human we meet people there and say like you know can we just be seen as us because really I'm not that much different no I love mm -hmm. that that's maybe my new on my wall there's a joy in every storm yeah that's like brilliant that's brilliant because I, I, I like I love the two that what there's anything she's really good at is like dad jokes and one-liners. She's great. I would have a, a myriad of t-shirts and hats with slogans. We're going to do that, Megan. Like we're totally making t-shirts and hats now. Yeah, I'm a count. I never made it live. Was to celebrate the wins. I'm like, I want to do something one day with that. Just like little slogans. Yeah. We, this is a sidebar. Welcome to two married people with severe ADHD. Hey. Um, <laughs> She, at one of our first season we coached together, we got into the championship uh, round and we were going into the final game, do or die. She tells the girl, she goes, if we win, I'll get celebrate the wins on my ass. I'll get it tattooed. So we lose in the final game, super sad, we're distraught. I think what, like a week and a half later, she actually went and got it done. She has it tattooed on her arm now, which I was like, so I think it's so good. It's like one of the best slogans ever. Well, because I love what you said, you know, things happen for a reason. I don't necessarily believe that, but celebrate the wins and there's joy in every storm. Like that, that is universal. That is mm -hmm. absolutely universal. Those statements are, anybody can pause and be like, whatever shit storm I'm in, whatever boxes I'm in, whatever, there's something to be learned, to be gained. There's some kind of joy. And there's little wins in that shit storm. Like, I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah. So yeah. brilliant. Yeah, so much. It. And it's a and large so where we operate. Yeah. Like not even just as a couple, but for sure. in like the space that we take for the girls we coach, such a huge part of our life. 
that well, literally takes up like a lot of our time, <laughs> quite literally, but um, how we operate in that space is how we wanted or how we want girls to feel how we didn't get to you, not only as an athlete, but like as a human. And we spend a lot of time saying like, you're a human first before you walk in those arena doors. And part of that is saying that like, I don't care if you're purple, black, indigenous, gay, trans, like I actually don't care. Those pieces don't matter to us. What matters is that you get to walk in the door as like your authentic self. We're trying to figure that out because at like 17 to 21, like pfft, I couldn't tell my ass from my elbow. So like- We're just creating a safe space. Just that, like, be. They can be part of, part of the culture we want. And just yeah. have to, like, and I know Meg, you might share that story later, but you know, that first year of her- kind of having a girlfriend and things kind of exploding not once did her coaches come to her and say like hey are you good no they called my parents so they called your parents and basically said there was a girl outside the arena waiting basically like outed megan which caused the whole explosion mm -hmm. so, so a lot of the the space that we create for our athletes and for other people is to say that like those experiences that we've had we don't anyone in our power if we can to ever have to go through those spaces. And as a coach, it's my job. I believe my job to have the tough, you know, the tough conversations, the long, lengthy debriefings to say that, like, how are you doing? Because it impacts you. It impacts how yeah. you show up to the rank. It did for me, too. But yeah, for, it's pretty heavy. Yeah, well, yeah that's a, I just my mind is blown that your coaches outed you to your parents. So you're this like elite athlete and Megan you, you're probably humble but you were like a superstar we all know it so we can just like say it like you're you were it. it's like girls in this town boys in this town know who you are know what hockey player you were so I'm just saying the pressure just at that level alone just the pressure being that high end of an athlete alone yeah. let alone everything else that you're going through the boxes you're trying to jump through and break through and all the stuff and then these coaches that you know think that's not gonna have an effect on your game or your mental I mean right it's 80 percent of the game if you ask most psychologists <laughs> it's 80 percent of any sport is your is your mental game I can't even imagine the pressure and the oh my gosh the stress that must have been going through your body yeah I mean like I don't think they like outed it in the essence of like they didn't say yeah like she's dating her um just like it was like a year-end exit meeting and she had come like walked with me to the rank because like hey like because I was leaving of course out of the country pretty quick right she was American. So I, she had just walked me to the rink. Cause like, Hey, like I'll hang out while you're meeting and then we can like walk back to your, your dorm together. Right. Um, so I'm pretty sure like, I didn't hear about it for months, but like, you know, my coaches had like basically said, Hey, okay, like just a heads up. That was kind of weird or it was concerning. So of course, you know, we're a family of detectives, um, you know, put two and two together. Then she came to visit. Um, then that's kind of when things blew up. And like the honest truth is the times have changed, you know, but I do have like a lot of, I would argue it resentment at times. Um, Cause like, you know, even myself, like I wish I would have done counseling. I wish I would have like had some supports through that because to be honest, my freshman year was probably my best talk year. Um, like I did well, obviously other years, but like, I definitely like, there was a lot happening. There was a lot moving and there's a lot of parts, um, you know, and decisions I made that you're not always like, Hey, I could have handled that better. Of course. Like I'm not perfect in any of this. I definitely, can look back and say, you know, I wish I would have handled that better. I wish I would have had that conversation differently. And, you know, at the time you, you try to believe that everyone's doing their best for sure. Um, mm. And you can have some grace for that. But of course, like I'm a perfectionist. I always wish that, you know, you could have done things a little bit better, but it was a really hard time. Like it, it took a lot of my energy, took a lot of my focus and my emotional toll. Um, well, my so expectations are nice to have that conversation. The expectations of like a 17 or 18 year old to be able to like regulate like we remind even our athletes and being like, I'm, I'm 33. Like I, and I still struggle and it's part of my, like now going to be profession. So like, why would I have an understanding or the expectation that it's 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, even up to like 25 for you to be able to like, I'm feeling a bit embarrassed and it's making me show up like an ass. Like you're actually not going to do that. Or like, I'm angry with you because that hurt my feelings. That seems really like kind of rudimentary or like really fundamental. But when you're in that space, it's not. It's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So our biggest shtick as coaches and just humans in general is like creating the safe space for them to actually have that really simple conversation that seems really scary and make it not so fucking scary. 
At least you're fifth best- place. You're not going to light on fire. So we're going to be okay. You're not going to light Aww. on fire. I love that. I I love how you guys are, you're creating like your couple together. You two just seem like you guys have such a, a safe and like have each other's back kind of relationship. And now you're creating that atmosphere and that energy for these other girls that you guys are coaching. Like, I think it's just extraordinary that, that you get to be that role model, um, individuals, but also couple for these girls and, and be that safe place. Like your stories are beautiful. And I have a question. I know it's not on our question list, but I I can't help but want to ask it. If you, for both of you, if you could go back to give your little five-year-old self some advice, what would you say to that little five-year-old part of you? Oh man. The first thing that instinctually that comes to me is like in like joy, just experience joy. I think, I think I spent a lot of my time as a young kid and I don't, I struggle going back like all the way because people ask me like, oh, did you know that you were gay like your whole life? Oh, friggin' no, I didn't pay attention to it. I just did. Um, But there's a joking of like seeing pictures as I was growing up. Like there's one, I'll send it to you, Alicia, you'll laugh. There's one with me, like, me in a sink as like a baby with like a backwards like flat brim hat on. And I was like, okay, we didn't know that was hard for everyone. Like being like cliche on it but I yeah right like nobody pay attention but I think a lot of the time I tried to live up to a lot of expectations and I don't think that's a unique experience I think you two could probably say you did the same thing for your parents I think Meg could say it I think every kiddo that I've worked with or talked to is that they want to meet some sort of expectation that even if their parents don't even know it your kids want to make you happy they want to make you proud and then they lose the experience in between they lose the joy and i think again that's kind of where we are rooted to it's like i i want kids to have fun sometimes being competitive is fun sometimes laughing dancing in the dressing room playing you know dress room karaoke or doing whatever belting a song in the car it's like having that space of like literally just being that authentic self because i think that's where joy lives is being in so space. so your five-year-old stuff you're saying there are some boxes maybe you have to not wiggle so much in, but there's also going to be boxes in your life that, that you can break apart just to be wiggly and find joy. So find those ones. Maybe it's outside with your friends, maybe it's by yourself in the sink with your hat on backwards, but find yeah. those. Yeah. I love that. F the box. Just off the box. Yes. I mean, mm, there's probably lots. I probably download everything and send it back to myself for sure. <laughs> Um, I'm not very present at times. So Aaron will tell you this, it's a work in progress. So um, for sure, like I am dedicated to my task list. I am going to do everything. Um, my definition of happiness at times, not all of this, but some days is like, hey, did I get things done today? That's how I live my life. Um, that's how I've historically lived my life. So I'm like, I got to accomplish everything that will make me feel good. Um, so just being present, finding a way to like stay in your body, finding a way to like balance with achievement with like also enjoyment. Um, always like imagine a little girl in like a tutu dress, like like have fun. It doesn't always have to be a task. And so we've had that conversation. It's just like, you know, find a way to be in your body. I know it's a challenge for me for sure, but I think that's something that like all of us probably probably can have a little more joy in our lives with if we if we're just there or sorrow or anger, right? But at least knowing what you're feeling. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, I was just going to say, I love, I love what both of you, both of what, kind of what you guys have said is like being present and, and experiencing joy and, and tying that in also to the expectations that we get from our parents. And I know Alicia and I've talked a lot about this on our podcast that, you know, we're as children, we're prone to um, move towards, you know, pleasing the parent and that attachment before authenticity. So, you know, and you're both saying authenticity, like if you could just experience, like, just be, just be present, just be playful, just have joy. And, and it's just, it's such a good message. I think for people, everybody to hear just, you know, as a reminder, even as parents to maybe lay back a little bit on the expectations of our kids, because when we come from families where there is performance and there is expectation and sometimes religion, where there's 
you know, we have to be this and we have to be a Christian. And this is what this looks like. It's like, I'm always falling into those boxes of who do I have to be? Who do I have to be? But just to be, and just to experience and just be present in the moment and enjoy. I love that. Yeah. It, you know, and I, I'm guilty. Like I, my kid plays hockey and I remember so many times after games or during games or, you know, talking with him after his, you know, his experiences and be like, how was that? And could you work harder? And what do you need to do better for next time? And all these years later, I'm like, now I'm just saying, when you play your best, Drew, it's when you're having fun. I can tell when his head's bopping and he's singing to the song. I'm like, oh, he's gonna have a good game today. Why didn't figure that out at five years old? I was like, you gotta skate faster. You gotta, you know, get your stick handy. Like now I'm just like, did you have fun? What could you do to have more fun today? What song can we play before you on the way to the game? Like have more joy. You're going to play better. It translates to your life. Like the, yeah. Yeah. again, like I think as a competitive athlete, like the edge is what makes it fun to you. Like the structure and the, the kind of pace that you get to push. So there's this like really delicate balance of like, how do you fall into those expectations of being pushed, being challenged? Like I wouldn't know what my edge was if I didn't have a coach going like, get your shit together. Right. Like I wouldn't, or, you know, or my dad on the drives home or whatever, right? Like it was like, I needed the push to understand. Did it detriment me at times? Absolutely. But I also needed that edge to know where I could push to. So I think finding that balance and being like, you actually can have fun and compete. And They're I think we've lost the plot. Yeah, we've lost the plot in this essence of like, they are these like dualities. It's like, absolutely not. They actually morph together really well. And as an elite athlete or competitive athlete, like you can find that flow. Right? You find the flow of like, how do you just be the best games we tell our players that you have is like when you actually stop thinking yeah. and you just do your present. And our job as coaches is to help make those thought processes as easy as possible. So we give you tips and tricks and all those types of things um, to help you maneuver through your game as best as possible. So that it's not overthinking all the time. I think realistically to me, life is the same line. Right. Not so friggin' hard. It's usually much better. Mm -hmm. yeah. so true so true which segues us to a whole nother topic that you guys both brought up a few times this idea of being back in your body mm -hmm. so i'm you know let's talk about sex for a sec i'm curious about and you just even with yourself like segueing from like being out of your body not present in your body being in the boxes doing all the things there's a lot of shoulds in there and there's a lot of like traditions like you said religions cultures bleh, boxes um to being present to you knowing your body and getting into you and then experiencing sex totally differently tell us about that I should make it took like a big inhale. She's like, oh, oh. <laughs> just let me regulate. No, I think <laughs> this was an interesting thing. Like, and I, Alicia knows this about me. Like I, I openly talk about sex because I think a lot of women don't in the right ways. I think we like teach kids about like sex ed and we do all the things and like, okay, great. But we actually don't talk about like the underneath of it all. We kind of shame the, like the desire, the presence, the, like the actual things that happen within your own body that no one else gets to define, but you. And I spent a lot of time and space being something I wasn't really. Like I jokingly have said, like, I don't know if there's a, a partner I've been with minus my wife. And I mean that holistic, like wholeheartedly. I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> that I haven't faked. I haven't faked an orgasm. I haven't like faked my way through it because that was an agreement I made with myself when kind of before you and I even got together was like, I'm done doing that. Because there's no, there's like this essence of like space for women, particularly in our like social constructs to be like, oh, our partner has to be happy. And the only way to be happy is if I have an orgasm or if I have this space. And the guilt that comes with that. And the guilt that comes with that. And then, you know, so it's this whole thing. It like puts you into your head, which is like not the space for intimacy at all. Right. It's the same thing of like literally finding flow. Like if I'm in my head, there's no space for connection. Um which took me a long time when you are not with your preferred sexual partner, you know, sex wise, that's a hard place to walk into, right? Like you literally like for me, and this sounds heavy, uh, but for myself being with men, because I slept with men in between um, my partners, it was kind of like an emotional bashing for myself. It was like a punishment. I didn't want the emotional connection. So therefore this is what I would do to myself. And yeah, that took me a long time to figure out it being like, I have to make this work because the other stuff is too fucking hard. Mm -hmm. So that space for me made sex a very scary place on top of sexual trauma and the other things. But I think finding that connection to myself was 
when can I literally just be in my whole sense of my body? And that took a long time, took a lot of practice to like yeah. actually see that space and be okay with my body and what it liked and what it wanted. Yeah. Being honest, yeah. being really authentic and really human about like, oh, that's actually, yeah. and that's okay. Well, that's what I said earlier, when you say, I found this space of authenticity, you said like so easy. And I'm like, but what you're saying now, if you could just, I'm just unpack it a smidge, you're like, actually, I'd rather just like go and bash myself and abuse myself and let myself be abused because that's easier than <laughs> authentic self. So it's not just an easy, it's a deep dive, windy road to get to that space of actually being embodied with yourself, with your sensuality, with your sexuality, with all of it, with your whole being. It's a massive topic. It's huge. And especially for, um, I always laugh that like you go on like TikTok or whatever. And it was like, oh, it's so like, it's normalized that women are coming out at a later age, it's like this whole thing. And it's like, okay, yeah, absolutely. And I love it. I love to see that women are like stepping into the space that like feels good to them. I also know how scary that is at like 25, 26, going and like having sex with a woman for the first time. I felt like a virgin all over again. I've been with the same partner for literally like 12 years, right? So like from like just a little infant really to like into like adult life. And I was supposed to know what I was doing. And then to enter into probably an incredibly toxic relationship for a handful of years that didn't teach me the right things. I just followed the same thing, but just with a different gender, right? Mm -hmm. So then it was like, oh boy that's not correct either. And like, how do I actually want to operate in space and be in that and feel okay? Um, and knowing like, what do I define as good sex? Which is actually part of me, right? Like I am not a great partner for some people or wasn't. And some people were not great. Most weren't great for me. So finding that space of like, how do I want to operate and what do I want and need and be okay with talking about it and like actually speaking it out loud and not like pretending that like telepathy becomes a thing, particularly when you're sleeping with someone that doesn't really know you and being like, oh, how do you not know that I don't like that? And then we just like lay there and like hope it finishes faster than it probably is going to. <laughs> right. So it's it, it, it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> it's orgasm. This is we have talks about it. It's, it's true. Not, it's true. Right. Like, so poor like and poor Megan, because now like when we first got together, I was in that space of like, she probably thought it was like some witchery voodoo at some point. Cause I just, I was really at that point, like really in my body. I was really kind of like, this is the space that I share. I don't fuck. I have very like intimate sex. Cause that's what I want. That's a connection that I had like agreed to have with my next partner because I didn't want it to feel emotionally disengaged. Cause that was a cause like a fight or flight kind of response for me given my past and then Meg it was very opposite so like finding that space like it wasn't it wasn't that the sex was bad it was like oh boy we're like both triggering like different compatible sexual places and having to sit in that space which I think has been great like well obviously we're married now but it's something that we were honest about right away to be like this is what is important and sex is important for both of us for different reasons and for same for some and to have that, that safe space to have that dialogue of like, this is happening in my body in real time, what's happening in your body. And let's slow it down. Let's talk about that's, that's mm -hmm. the place to have that conversation about those things. And how can I support you in your journey of your whole self, of your whole authentic being? And like, knowing that like, even if it's not going the way it's supposed to, right? We have this like expectation of like, this is how sex is going to look and how it's going to feel and going to be. And the, even now, it's like, if it's not driving, it's like, okay, hold on a second. Like, revamp that never happens ever. right but if it's like I'm distracted like I laugh and being like I could if I don't have my ADHD meds and I'm like not in it I am listening to the clanking on the window I hear like I am nowhere near where I'm supposed to be and I have to be like okay hold on hold on a second like I gotta like get back in it I gotta like sensory self bring it in but like having that honest conversation and being like yeah does it feel weird to say like hey hold on a sec I'm listening to the garbage can lid hit outside. Like I'm actually not in, I'm not here. Um, and not taking her, not taking it as a personal attack and just finding like it funny. I'm like, oh, okay, I hear you. I'll shut the window or like, let's turn some music on or like bring it back into a space that it's like actually really safe. And I think for a lot of women, that's a, that's a really hard ask having that safety. 
Because in yeah. my case, I think safety was determined by like being physically safe. Mm-hmm. We talk a lot yeah. about consent and all that kind of stuff, which is absolutely needed. And then that emotional safety of being able to say like, hey, this, I need something different or I desire something more or less or whatever. That safety is forgotten sometimes, I think, or in mine's works. But yeah, yeah. And when she's thinking about the garbage can lid, Megan's like, I'm just in my black and white A to B to Z. Yeah. What's the problem here? <laughs> Get with the program. Yes. Yeah. That's probably more me, to yeah. be honest. Like, if I don't take my meds first thing in the morning. Um. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, I just have a very different experience. I, I didn't like have, um like I had boyfriends, but like not, not, I didn't like have multiple boyfriends like I don't have this history with men um around that arena like in in like great detail I have some great detail but not a ton um I've just kind of always like in that arena prior to being with women um I just kind of felt like I was obligated to do something like that's just my own internal thing and it wasn't like necessarily sex it could be making it with somebody it could be whatever um I just kind of felt like yeah this is what's gonna happen whether I didn't think I really questioned if I really wanted it. No one ever forced me. It was always like I was fully entering into that agreement, but um, I don't think it ever felt like a hundred percent authentic. Um, and that's just something that like, doesn't feel great when you look back at it. You're like, Oh shit. Like I'd like not like to do that again. Um, but like, what are you going to do? So for me, like I don't have a lot of presence. Um, so when we first started dating, I had just ent- exited, uh, you know, a really, really long relationship. We'd been together um, for a long time, years and years. Um, we were engaged. And so, like, I actually was not in a place I wanted to be in a relationship. I had basically been, you know, taken down um, to, like, you know, we'll say the bottom of the mountaintop and had to, like, figure out how to get my shit together again, um, which I'm super grateful for. No one really wants to be taken out at the knees, but if you do, it's a, probably the biggest gift in your life. So when we met, um, you know, like I was still like pretty raw. I still had some stuff. I wasn't obviously intending on being in a relationship. And so my presence was filled with anxiety, filled with like fear, filled with all the things. So it's pretty hard to like give you what you needed. Um, and then also give her what she needed when I like just didn't feel like I could be there hundred percent. So that was definitely not always an easy conversation and it was a back and forth dialogue. Um, and you may not know this, but we did take a sabbatical. Um, right. So Aaron calls it a sabbatical. So we had broken up um, about four months after we had uh, got together. And she was still living in Grand Prairie. Um, and we just kind of like, distance isn't my thing. I'm kind of awkward in transition. I enter the house after coming home from work. It's really hard for me. I've worked really hard at that. But that initial moment of like, okay, you're going to see me, um, whether that be judgment, all the things that, you know, I have to work through in my brain has been really hard. So like transition in space, feeling awkward, opening gifts, I hate it, can't stand it. Because if I don't have the right reaction, in my mind, it's like, I, I don't even enjoy it. So I'm like, I okay, I'm not excited family enough. Of gift givers, by the way. Um, you know, this isn't authentic enough. So like I lose all sense of like any type of excitement from it. Mm-hmm. So it's been like, it's been a hard, hard adjustment, but we both, um, Aaron would hate me telling this, but when we broke up, I was like, Hey, like, just so you know, like mm-hmm. we're still going to get married one day. I've never been a big believer. Um, I'm probably the most, I'm probably more cynical than, than you are for sure. I tend to walk into a room. I'll see the crooked picture. That's the way my brain has been wired for sure. I have to fight against that. So mm-hmm. it's like, Hey, like just, you know, we're still gonna get married one day. It was the nicest breakup I've ever had in my life. I still cried. And uh, I said, you want to come to Lethbridge? I'll take you on a date. And I'm pretty sure she sat on the other end of the phone and was like, fuck you. I don't want to like hear that right now. Um, And it wasn't like a forced thing. So, you know, I went to counseling once a week went to, and you kind of dove in and we did the work and wasn't meant that we were perfect when we got back together, but we were just able to show up in a different space of like, Hey, like I was committed to, if I could be with you again, um, to do the work that like I would allow me or facilitate uh, me to be there in a better way that like we could both show up for that place knowing that it's still going to be hard and still be sticky stuff and I think it's much like anything really like sex is also a conversation right like I'm a firm believer and I remember initially when we dated I had said to Megan I think you can fall in love with anybody that's not something that you that's not something you choose it just happens I didn't want to fall in love with particular people and I did. Did it hurt me? Yes. 
the choice is when you're willing and wanting to build and adapt and evolve in that relationship. That's to me, that's like true love. That's your soulmate, the person that you're willing and wanting to like share that space with. It's when I say that I get to, right? Like I get to help you in transition. I get to share space with you, even when you vibrate. I call it vibrate really high. Um, it's mostly when she's anxious. Um, but I get to do those things and I want to. Yeah, I, I, like I step in and I go, there's some days where I'm like, oh, I don't want to today. And then other days where I'm like, okay, it's okay. But there's always a percentage of me that it's like, I will always lean in. And one of the biggest moments I've had with my own therapists and some that I have kind of done trials with is they ask about my safety given my history. And they'd say, well, how do you feel when you're with Meg? And I said, there's never been a time when I become a tantruming toddler, you know, and I have parts of me that are showing up that are angry and not okay, that the underneath is like, she's going to fucking leave. We're going to get in this fight and she's gone. Or I'm going to have this fight and I'm packing my shit. I'm a runner. Like, because of my history, because of where I come from, I'm like, I'll pack my shit. You stay. I'm going to go. Because I know that I'm fiercely loyal and I will fight through anything. So if I actually stay, like, I have to be willing and wanting. So part of my healing journey was saying, stop doing that if it's harming you. And being knowing of when that's feeling authentic to you. So for Meg and I, like, I actually am not scared. I'm not scared to have conflict. And I think it's so brilliant that we can sit there and have it and be sticky and prickly and uncomfortable and jiggly and then go like, okay, cool. What do you want for dinner? (laughs) I was born and bred for conflict. Aaron was not. Mm -hmm. So that's where I can like, unfortunately not thrive, but uh, it's an easy default for me. I go from extreme. So like I can be uh, very dorsal. So very kind of like, like very shut down. Um, or I get very like, it goes one way or the other, but I've come to a place that like, that's very well regulated because of the work that I've done. And I think for you too, that you've been able to like match that tone. It's the first time probably in my life because I went from being like extremely like turtled to now being able to like, Hey, this doesn't feel right. I never had a voice. That was a really, really hard for me. That was like my thing is like being muted. Ooh, like I get all clustered and like not okay. Where Megan's whole upbringing was like, I need to be very loud. I need to be loud. I need to be heard. I need to be seen. I don't know if I need to be. I just was. Yeah. <laughs> like that's the, that There's was no the, active the choice flow and rhythm of your life was to create space for yourself. Yeah. We're also just a we're different family, you know, different dynamic, family. louder, um, busier. Mm-hmm. yeah yes. but you always say so many beautiful skilled things i don't even know if you know how skilled like if stan was listening he'd be proud just saying right now he'd be like wow they are doing the couple bubble well and he's our guru like he's our guy right like the idea of like we get to have each other's backs we get to be in the rabbit hole together we get to have hard conversations we get to be messy and jiggly and vulnerable and 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 be the person beside the partner who's encouraging authenticity even when it's raw and hard and going to create hard conversations like that's what relationships are really about like you said Aaron you could fall in love and work with anybody but the person that you're going to stay with long term is a person that you feel safe enough to do the work with that's like my number one in my relationship that's my that's our that's our vow you're paying the ass I'm paying the ass but my vow is like my number one rule is my deal breaker would be if we're not doing the work I want to continue to grow and evolve as a human being and I want you to be the person beside me to make space for me to be my big messy self but also continue to push me to be my big messy self and that's what we do together that's that's for me the key everything else is important as well but that part that you just said right there is the key of like i think foundation of safety growth so yeah you guys are doing it i i love i love it too i have to i have to throw in my two cents i i wrote down a couple things too leisha i was like the two things that stand out to me the most what you guys said was one you're leaning in which i think that that is that's like a big key for, for any couple, whether like any kind of couple lean in most couples lean out and they're like, no, I have to protect myself. Screw you. I'm doing the thing. This is your fault. And you're leaning in, which is creating safety and security. You're going, let's come back into this bubble. Let's do this little couple huddle, like, like a team, literally like a, like a hockey team. Let's huddle together. How are we going to take care of this? And then the other big thing is you master each other. 
you're understanding each other's history and you're not shaming each other for it. You're not being like, Oh, I wish you could change that. It's like, Oh yeah, well she's black and white. Oh yeah. Well, she's a little like, she's either going to freak out or she's going to want to leave, but that's okay. I get her. I'll, I'll be this little stable base here. And that is beautiful. I mean, that is, that's doing the work forever. And like Alicia was saying, I mean, for both of us, those would be deal breakers of like, we're always going to grow and evolve together. And so to be in that place of like, we're both going to be using your word present, right? We're actually like, that's something you guys have both talked about presence. We're going to be present with each other and we're going to, we're going to grow and evolve together. Yeah. And I think it's um, interesting, like, even with Alicia talking about like, a, you know, my sister just says like, I know she's just married and it's like, uh, we don't do anything different. It's just that we have a lot of estrogen in like one space. Right. And you just like hope. I don't know. It's like the joke is like, hopefully you don't sink. Cause like that would just, you know, at least if we can separate it, I can take care of you and make sure you're okay. And then it goes the other direction and we're good. Um, but it's not any space of being like, I wouldn't, my expectation of man or woman, I would presume in a relationship is that I would, that's what I need. I need to feel safe that I can lose my mind and then go back and be like, Oh God, sorry. That wasn't, that wasn't great. And her just being like, okay, yeah, that sucked. That hurt my feelings. And like, how do we do it better? Or how do we transition? The funniest fight, not fight, but the funniest conflict we've had is um, I had Rhea before Megan and I got together. And she was like my sidekick. We did everything together. I lived by myself. She's my, she's like, she was the love of my life at the time. Megan comes in my life. I have now lost my dog. Like it is not, it's she Megan's lost dog. Lost her dog. Okay. <laughs> She'll defend it. But she died. It was really hard for me. Towards me. It was really hard for me. Like so tough. So, and then when we were working through like, how do we transition through space? So Megan had a really hard time. She goes to work where she's like she's a financial advisor, right? Like it's very tight. It's very clean. It's very black and white. So when she comes through the door and you have like fluffy gray Aaron, who's like, oh, I'm excited to see my girlfriend or fiance at the time. And I'm like, oh, yay. And she comes home and she's like, okay, so we're having dinner and then we got a practice plan. We got And I'm like, um, I need some softness. What's happening? So at the beginning, it was like, oh, I'll use the dog. Like I'll use the dog as like this transition kind of space. Well, I'd just gravitate towards her. So you would gravitate towards her and I would be like, hello, love me. <laughs> God, <laughs> the dog doesn't even love me as much anymore. And then you guys are just loving each other. Fuck. It's okay, Raven. And I would just be so, like, I was just sad. Like literally just like having a tantrum, like a toddler. And eventually it was a conversation that she was like, okay. And I was like, can we just like make an agreement that you like, can you hug me first? Like just let, I don't have to say anything. Just like hug me first, give me a kiss. And then you can pet the dog. My tail's wagging too. Can you yeah, see my like, tail wagging dog too? Right now. Okay. Like I don't care. Just like, I want to feel important. And for the long, it was like the funniest thing. And eventually when I spat it out, I was like, that sounds so dumb. And then it's been, it was easy. It was an easy kind of task that we've created that is like stuck, that has welcomed transition really well and helped, I think, like transition hasn't been an issue really transitions will always be difficult for me but but not as, much. not as much like I remember we first dated and we were like long distance and I would come to visit or she'd come over and she just like lit, what I'm like telling you she like vibrates really high at that time and storm up. like buzzing around and I was in like a 650 square foot apartment it was like uh are you okay do you need a drink do you need an edible like I don't know what to give you and so that was like, so again, it was, so now like, that's not even a, not even a thing. But I think that for me to even like say those things was really hard because speaking needs was difficult. But I think if you're not able to have that conversation, like I can imagine if you did that for like months and months and months and I never said anything, it probably would be, end up being like a deal breaker. It would turn into this big blow up because I wouldn't feel like a priority or I would feel that like you love the dog more than me which seems ridiculous, but I would presume that I'm not the only person that's ever felt that before. No, that's every couple. I think that could be kids. That could be your job. That could be your, your dog, your animals. It could be candy crush on your phone. It doesn't matter what, it's a third. It's anything else that the relationship is a third. And what you're saying is, hey, that thing over there, you're, you're, it's wagging its tail and get attention before I am. And we are the, we're supposed to be the, you know, the captains of the ship together. <laughs> we're supposed to be the ones at the top of the, of the food chain here. And I feel like I'm, you know, third or fourth on the food chain. And that's it. That's, that's a mismanagement of thirds. That's every couple that doesn't pay attention to that mm -hmm. for sure. And so I love that you just, that you did it naturally. You're like, Hey, I love that you love the dog. I love that you love the kids or I love that you love your job, whatever that thing is. 
but I'm up here with you. Like we have an agreement that we run this ship as co-captains together. So can you check in on me first or can I check on it? And then you just did it in a playful, nacho way. Like hug me first. <laughs> I don't know if it was that nice, but I, I'm pretty sure I was crying. Okay. Oh. It's one of those things of being like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then it was like, I'm not okay. Like debilitated and her being like, is this actually a built-in dog? Yes. Yes. Well, that word fine, right? You know, my definition of fine. So that word fine is a, is a real clear word. Uh, yes. But I think, yeah, it's more so of finding, again, I know this like all started off like talking about like how sex and how we have that conversation. But like, if you can't have a conversation about like giving the dog attention before you give me attention, how are you going to talk about the most vulnerable space on the planet? Literally. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you are going to be naked, sharing space and all sorts of things with another person but I can't tell you that I like steak over chicken like that to me I was like ah like that was probably again probably one of the biggest things for me was like oh hmm, I have to have a voice because if I don't have one like sex is going to be probably terrible forever so no yeah, that was kind of my agreement to myself anyway was finding that space because sometimes being comfortable don't to Megan's avoidant attachment system which I know she has based on our conversations, I already figured oh. that out. Cause I am one, Megan takes one to know one. That's like, I'm like, I get her. But even her system is just like, oh, uh, but even asking for that and having, you know, asking for you, you to, her to hug you first actually is good for her system too. So it's, it's actually repairing both systems at the same time. It's creating a connection of your nervous systems. Even though hers is like, I want to buzz around. That's what I do. And I just like avoid, avoid, avoid. I avoid emotion. I just lock and load. I do what I do top down. Right. But it's actually helping her system go, okay, mm -hmm. now what? Yeah, it's just like an awkward space, right? And I've known that since I was a little kid. I've known that I've been that way. So I obviously have had conversations. I've tried to do the work and, you know, it's just one of those things that's been really hard for me, but obviously just trying to find the little things you can do that aren't like changing everything and expecting miracles to happen. Um, so yeah, Rhea has to wait 10 seconds. You know, she stands at my our feet and very excited, but um, it's okay. Right, like, and she's really happy to see her mamas are hugging. She's like, oh, they're so cute. Now pick me next, but oh, they're so cute. If I wait too long, I mean, she gets like a little antsy, but that's that's human, right? Just like mm -hmm. if, if I wait too long, Aaron obviously gets uncomfortable and sits there and is like, why aren't you loving me? And then I'm getting anxious and it like creates this space that like actually grows 10 times the size of the house. So. Yeah, love it. Mm -hmm. love I it. have a, I have a question for, for um, both of you. I'm curious for our audience as well, there's likely people listening who maybe are struggling with their sexual orientation. And um, you both have had a journey where it hasn't been, well, I don't know if anybody's journey is easy, but it hasn't been easy just, you know, finding who am I and, and where do I kind of align? Is there any advice that you would give to people who are struggling with, um, I'm going to use the phrase coming out, like just being honest and open about their sexual orientation? Go to therapy. <laughs> Call Aaron, uh, just in case you want uh, somebody who <laughs> insert advertisement actually no. knows a little bit of what that is. Um, I definitely think like having that trusted person, if it's not a therapist, someone who actually is going to have your back because you don't want to be outed. Um, if that's where, you know, like we use that term, you do not want to be outed by somebody because it will like completely erode all of your faith and trust in like other relationships. So I think if it's not a, a therapist or a psychologist, like it has to be someone who's not going to talk about it because that will just feel like a new kind of betrayal on top of just feeling like your whole world just blew up. Right. So I think that's super, super, super critical. Um, I don't know. Love yourself a little bit. I think a lot of times, like I've been more probably homophobic to myself than anyone has ever been towards me. So like you, you really have to like sit in that uncomfortableness because it's like actually super tough and there's still moments I'm like, okay, like, you know, like you have to just move through it. Um, and there's like little like things you can do, right? You can challenge stereotypes. Like we are not the active pride participants. It doesn't mean we're not proud of who we are, but like, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden we changed everything about that. But you know, at times, I mean, we're like, you don't want to deal with it for sure. I mean, I put pride tape on my hockey stick because of the whole NHL ban on pride tape. So they didn't want them to use their jerseys. And so I was just being, I'm not a pretty big, I'm not a large activist. I work in a super like office world. Like I, you know, I'm one of very many females. So of course I go to a coaching clinic and it's all men. 
<laughs> it's like, oh man, I'm sitting there. He's talking about how like, okay, maybe we'll coach emails, but you guys probably won't. I don't think he saw me, which is okay. And of course I'm thinking we we're gonna have an on ice session and I've never had pride anything on my hockey gear in my entire life. And of course there's pride tape on my fucking stick right now. And there's 30 guys. And I'm like, this is making me, making me uncomfortable. Like, I'm like, do I take it off? Do I not take it off? Like, I don't want someone to look at me and be like, oh, she's gay. And then that changes their opinion of me. Like, I don't like that that could be a thing. The other part of that is I'm also putting that on people, right? So I think that like, sometimes we're projecting that out. Um, so the only thing I can say is I went to a retreat one time and she's become my friend since then. Um, but we had to partner up. It was like a three day course in Oregon. We had to partner up with a random stranger, um, to do like some like timeline work. Um, and I looked across and I knew I'd go with, had to look with this lady she's from Jersey and she had this like massive cross on her neck and like crystals. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sakes, like oh this is uncomfortable I'm like I don't want to talk about it um you know just because you just think okay like maybe that means you're not for it maybe that's gonna make you uncomfortable are you gonna judge me like all the things that I bring myself right um and again there's joy in every storm so my lesson was like we go through it and you know my partners with, with me at the time it wasn't Aaron um we go through this whole thing and it was my turn and eventually like I you know told her ripped the bandit off fast forward two days later I'm like I was terrified like I was terrified because I was like this is uncomfortable this is gonna be good and she just starts laughing like starts hysterically laughing she's like you know what the funny part is I'm not religious my my daughter's actually bought me that necklace because I thought it was pretty <laughs> so like <laughs> there is um you know like little reminders mm -hmm. so find someone you trust you know have those tough conversations but also like love yourself enough to like sit in that uncomfortableness and honor it and acknowledge it and move through it because a lot of it is us there is moments we get discriminated against mm -hmm. there always will be um but i think like if it's if you don't have any peace in your own body um it doesn't matter what anyone does for you so like that's a constant struggle it doesn't mean i'm perfect at it it means i still have to battle with that and and move to a level of acceptance and confidence without screaming from the hilltop and without hiding it's a, it's, it's a constant you know navigation right if that makes sense yeah that's beautiful because the more you get comfortable in your own space and your own authenticity on your own definitions of who you are and what you stand for your own work you know um, values morals ethics the less those crosses affect you mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think for for me i think megan will laugh you and like i remember her like scolding me so i left carson and was dating a person at the time that was not good for me um, and continue to be for many years after that. Um, but to this day, she was like, why the fuck didn't you talk to me? You had one friend of like, ha like over a decade who was openly gay and you didn't have that conversation with me or you didn't ask me questions or you didn't like go through it. And at the time, I just didn't think about it. I was so focused on like protecting myself from my family or from friends that were struggling with not just because I was gay but that I was getting a divorce because of their feelings and insecurities. so I really isolated myself alienated myself mm -hmm. um so I, I think finding some people for sure that you trust I had a great therapist at the time um that helped me through a lot of it but I think being surrounded by your community um, is a big deal. I talk a lot about like your chosen family because sometimes, you know, there is a space that your family doesn't agree or they can't move through it or um, those that you believe that you shared a lot of space with walk away from you, whether that's emotionally, physically. Um, so that safe space is there. I would love to say that, yes, we are just married. That's how we see it. But mm. the reality of the world is that we are not just married. We are gay married. And Sometimes that reality is shitty. It sucks because we get it. We live in our own, like I jokingly, like we live in our own little like unicorn and rainbows and butterflies and just our world. It's and okay. We're in like our own little bubble. Like occasionally our bubble better. gets popped because we realize, you know, we've Fuck. got a good community of, yeah. of you know, and you don't surround yourself with people, people who don't. Like we just have like we have our community, and then you go into the world and you're like, huh, you forget sometimes. And you're like, shit, oh, that doesn't come up for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it doesn't make it easy, but I do think we isolate ourselves, right? You're like, I'm, I'm sad. I'm alone. I'm unhappy or 
I'm scared. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes give your give your friends and family the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't mean you have to be naive. I knew my family would not be happy and that has been proven right. <laughs> um, we've definitely maneuvered a little bit for sure. And I know it's not been easy for them either, but find somebody, right? There's a lot of mentors out there. There's a lot of people out there um, that also be willing to like pick up the phone and just say like, how you doing? Um, but people will surprise you sometimes. And sometimes we don't mm -hmm. give them the benefit of the doubt or give them the opportunity to love us because we don't actually want to feel loved. Yeah. Well, we oh. find space of, it's really hard to navigate it emotionally for yourself and then help other people navigate the same thing on a different side of the coin. It really like takes away from your experience. So I think the therapeutic avenue for me was, was saying, I can have my own experience and say like, okay, I'm okay. And then I can also level with my family at like how this might be a difficult transition for them because it is like having me the expectation that of like you know my daughter who is married and now is not going to be is now gay like I have to like wrap my head around that like what is that even if you like even for your parents right like there is a space there again I would love to tell you that there isn't that a mom would say like oh I'm so happy you're gay and the world is going to be like so kind to you all the time People don't it won't like be. change either. So they don't like change and the world is just shitty. Mm -hmm. Like a mom has that opportunity of like, I just want to grieve that for you. And it's not, and many beautiful conversations with my mom and her being like, I'm not, obviously you being gay is uncomfortable because it's new. And it's not because I don't agree with it or that I don't want you to not be happy. It's when she's just like curious. It's a new experience, a new exposure for her. And she also was sad that life would be more difficult. And that at 25, I didn't understand. I don't have kids. Now at 33, I can go like, oh, okay. You just didn't want life to be hard because nobody does. So like give some grace, give some grace and like self-compassion, not only yourself, but for your family, for your friends, because it's, it's different. It's just, mm -hmm. there's a level there that like the world is just, is what it is. And we have to like be mindful and we get reminded sometimes more aggressively than others and that sucks but for the most part we get to just like live life and that's pretty amazing pick your heart yeah. but if you find yeah. and surround yourself with the right people the heart isn't so hard yeah man mm -hmm. so many gems in there grace pick your heart okay dang you guys are good yeah yeah does it oh, it was that was that was beautiful. Does it feel for for both of you does it feel like the world is moving in the right direction like does it feel like there is a bit more compassion and curiosity. I think um, for myself, I think it really depends on like geographics. We're going to mm -hmm. joke. We're in the Bible belt here. So um, I think yes and no. I think, you know, I think if we're going to like go from the political landscape, polarization has happened more than I've ever seen it before. Um mm -hmm. Uh, I think a, a sense of like loneliness, a sense of people feeling lost, a sense of like, no, the earth has shifted and I don't even know where I stand. So we stand so harshly on one side because we need to have importance and we need to feel something and we need to be part of a community. I don't think that has helped. Um, and I would say that for all, all walks of life, to be completely frank, it's not just us. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of different levels of, 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 groups of people that have uh, different experiences and yeah like there's a lot of people that are super good um there's also some people who look at us like we have to educate them um which can be hard right like i'm not a zoo animal you may not view it as that but like i'm just a person here just trying to have a conversation and, and, I, and i've definitely had those conversations before of like hey like imagine if i sat down and talked to you and only asked about you being a psychologist you never got to talk about horses. You never got to talk about your children, your husband, like what makes you excited, what like fires your belly, what scares you, like nothing, just one part of your life. And so sometimes um, the intention can be good, but sometimes it's like, hey, like I'm actually just a human. So like we're pretty real, but you don't have the right to ask me all the tough questions right off the hop of meeting me just because you're curious or interested. Um, which doesn't happen all the time, but it is something that does definitely happen, right? Like I wouldn't sit down and be like, so how did your parents react to you and Jay getting married? What'd they think? Did they like them? Like, like that, that does happen occasionally. I'm like, why, why do you think that's like appropriate to ask? Um, or like, how'd you come out? Or do your parents support you? I'm like, man, I just, I just go like, buckle up. Are you ready? 
grab a drink. Like we're going to get into it. Like, I don't think it's always malicious. I just think that naivety of like, just imagine, just put yourself in her shoes for a second. Like, would you want that to be the only conversation you have? Um, so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of movement for sure. I think that polarization has happened and I think that has made it hard. Um, I think sometimes people just don't realize like, we're just human. Like you, what you, what hopefully you care about is our ethics and, and like, can we be supportive and kind, but, um, yeah, lots of movement in a lot of arenas. I think geography changes things. And I think this last couple of years has made it really, really tough. Cause I think we're all feeling a little bit lost. Yeah. I agree with that. Well said. Mm. Well said. Yeah, I agree. I think there's just like people are looking to belong and accept and be accepted and to feel that they are a part of something. Um, I will openly say that I think we've lost the plot. I don't like I think with we work so hard to not be labeled and to that's in general, I'm not saying like for the LGBT community, but just in general, like we have worked hard to have labels. I'm a psychologist. I'm an athlete. I'm a coach. I'm a this. I'm a that. And instead of something being just a part of you, it's become what you like, like soulfully identify as. I don't go and like shake my hand and say like, hi, I'm Erin, I'm gay. That's not like something I like, it's not, I don't care. Because like, preferably like, to me, I go like, would I ask you what like you and Jay do in bed? Like, no, I, like that's not something, I don't care off the meeting of you. But if I would say like, oh, like what do you do for a living? Or like, what's that part? And if you choose to share that, amazing. If you don't, I don't care really mm -hmm. right like I just want to have space where people want to I just identify with how you show up in space authentically be like if I was at like a gay parade and it was like part of the thing like okay like maybe but like not in everyday life when I'm meeting someone I am Aaron and this is my wife I would introduce her as that I hate that I have to double guess we have to read the room sometimes but I think Again, we're all just looking for some piece of belonging, whether that's like we belong to the political party that is against X, Y, or Z, or we belong to this part of us. But reality is we are many. Yeah. And you belong. I think the takeaway that you guys have said over and over again in this interview is you belong to your authentic selves first. First and foremost, you belong in here. And <clears throat> yep. your supports and, you know, masters, as Dana said, of each other in your sense of belonging here. And then how you show up and how there's, you know, there's no fitting in. Like, the box, there's no fit in. Let's belong to ourselves first. That's really all that matters. And at the day, that's where you need to belong, most importantly. And that's really yeah. the journey of life, is it not? That's a journey of authenticity, of like detaching from stuff and labels and all the boxes that we think and should and all the stuff, right? To actually come full circle back into belonging to self. Yeah. You guys are doing yeah. a really good job of, of not just for yourselves, but advocating for others. Like I know how you treat those kids on the ice and and how you advocate in life and how you show up in life. And I just, yeah, you guys are authentically amazing people, amazing humans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, yeah. I, I want, I, I think I want like most people or for listeners to know that like, it's not all the time. It's not like we like stepped in. Cause I think, and I've said this to Alicia and being like that, like raw humanness of like, be yeah, like humanly authentic, which means that like, this isn't, top notch all the time oh we, i'm not authentic all the time because that's not real what's real is like i have to put on my coach's hat or i have to put on my therapist hat or you know i didn't sleep last night or whatever and i have to like attune to like what my body needs and not like fall apart at the seams right like it ebbs mm -hmm. and flows and who you are is like an involvement it's never done it's this whole journey of like how this continues to happen your authentic self is actually just the journey of being present or right. at least fight for your ability to be you right yeah. and that's mm -hmm. it. so i think like we joke with the the girls at the rink and being like we natter and bicker and i don't care if the girls see it that sounds awful but being like i don't agree or like should we pull and i have to be like can you just stop talking for a second and i have my dealing with this and like and girls are like oh god that's you know we're not like rainbows and butterflies literally all the time but we are, in my mind, showing that we can navigate space even when we don't agree. And how do we get there, right? And they see that like Megan's vibrating high and her and I's ability to like co-regulate together in space. Someone's going to do it better one day than maybe the next one. But we actually show that that's a possibility because I think we also have this really wild concept that like 
it's just like smooth sailing all the time. That no, it's everything like the rockiest is... road you've ever been on. But beautiful, <laughs> right? Like it's mm-hmm. like those rocky moments. Like I would rather that. Oh, like life is life is hard, but it's beautiful. Like you just gotta like it's the truth. There's nothing smooth about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, letting go, mm-hmm. also letting go of that expectation that it's supposed to just be like it's a lie. We were easy. We we're child. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> like you just one day it's gonna just calm down yeah that's a lie someone told me that lie I believed it um it's just you you know try to try to like manage the swings better try Mm -hmm. to find people Mm -hmm. those metaphors those metaphors are great (laughs) it is I'm telling you in my head it's true but all of your things you guys have said like they know that's the question about like you know teens or youth or adults that are like coming into their sexuality those are questions that you're answering but you're answering questions actually for life in general like anybody can listen to this podcast and listen to this this interview and be like oh that if that actually that actually affects me oh that actually relates to me like that's a, these are really good gems for anybody yeah there's some you know sidebars for people that are you know struggling with sexuality or struggling with family but that could be family because of religion issues or family because of who knows what issues, political issues that you said, right? So there's so many other ways to take what you guys are saying today and, and just apply it to whatever stage of life, whatever, you know, part of life you're, you're struggling with. There's so many great things in here as mm-hmm. well in, this, in what you guys have said here today. Yeah. And, and I know that we're almost out of time, but I have one more question that I have to ask you guys, because you both said something. I love how you were talking about, um, you know, being put in a box where, you know, when somebody meets you, you know, if it, like for Alicia and I, people don't say, we don't introduce ourselves and say, hi, I'm Dana. I'm heterosexual. So I've been very into guys. Um, like we don't say that we don't talk like that's So, so it's like for Alicia and I, we've always said for couples, we just see them as couples, like whatever, who you do and what you do, as long as you guys are both consensual, um, that's cool. Like, I don't really like, and if you want to talk about it, that's awesome. But there's in Canada anyway, there is this, these boxes that we're starting to put people in. And I'm really curious for, for your perspective on SOGI, um, that is being rolled out across Canada in smaller, different places. I, I, it's not in Calgary, but it is in Edmonton and lots of places in BC, which is the sexual orientation, gender identity that is, um, in some, at as early as kindergarten, they're going around the classroom and asking what kids identify as. And so I've had a friend of mine um, in BC calling me lots with her daughters coming home and being, you know, really upset about being asked all the time what they identify as. And at five years old, they don't even have an analytical mind yet. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this box that we are asking young children to put themselves in. Yeah, I think we're not experts. Keep this in mind. Um, We have these conversations, uh, you know, just as like a couple and our own intellectual um, kind of debates and, and theory and, and things like that. I think it's important for me um, to recognize actually what the world is. And then obviously you have to work with the world within the confines of where it is. Cause we can say, ideally we would like it to be this, but it's not. Um, doesn't mean you can't have progress or change. And then the, the second thing being that like in a perfect world, you just want your kid to be a kid. That's what you want. So that means in a perfect world, their kids grow up in a home in which like they just got to be and there's no like hey like you can't do this you can't do that like yeah you have rules but like authentically encouraging them to just feel joy to feel sadness to feel happiness and to recognize it and then be able to move through it and encourage that space so I think at times um I think I get a little bit sad not because kids can't authentically be themselves but that you know we're encouraging this confusion a little bit um of like hey like hopefully they can just show up in the space And if they really felt a particular way, we could just honor that without having this massive debate or conversation around it. Um, Because I do think that like, if a a child did feel not, you know, in their body or felt, you know, that 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 box didn't determine them, that it's still another box. So that's the crappy part. And then the human nature of it is we, we don't only thrive in boxes. (laughs) So like we've, we've really, it's really, really hard. Like, it's super hard. I don't know the right answer for it. Um, I, I wish that like, it didn't even have to be a conversation with young kids. I don't know. I don't think about things like that as a kid. I was like, I just want to go play soccer or I don't. And I just want them to be encouraged to be them yeah. and a safe space to just show up. If that means you're not wearing a dress or you're wearing a dress or whatever. Um, and I think probably trying to do their best to try to create that space. But I think sometimes 
a force of that conversation almost makes it worse. And so you're getting a lot of backlash against the community as well, because it does feel like, is this the right approach to do it? So now we're going to push back a hundred percent. Um, I don't have an answer for it, but it is, it's a really, really tough one. And I don't know if I agree with it. Um, but I also know that like, I think they're trying, that doesn't necessarily mean they can't do it in a different way or in a different age or a different way of kind of approaching the combo. Yeah. It's funny as you were like sitting here, I'm like, okay, like listening and like, absolutely. You said that very eloquently, very brilliant. And I'm sitting here going like, I'm thinking about how we can articulate this without like offending our community. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> God. Like, so this like to me is wild in the space of being like, wow. Like, so even for me to have an opinion that I've worked really hard to like have space to just like be myself and love my wife and be safe in our community. I now am worried that the very community that I've worked so hard to be a part of is going to scrutinize me because of my opinion. So that's really hard. So that that was interesting while you're sitting there. I was like, wow. My first thought was I pictured myself. Um, my mom tells a story of me. I had bright, I think it was yellow, yellow rubber boots when I was about like four and a half, five. So like kindergarten, pre-K. Um, and I would get out of the house with my Cocker Spaniel at the time, naked with rubber boots on. And I wanted to go play in the puddles and be outside. So my thought, I'm like picturing this little five-year-old. I'm like, I don't actually think I gave a rip about it at all. I just wanted to not have clothes on and play in the puddles. So if that's what you want to ask me, brilliant. Do you like your yellow rubber boots or your black ones? Right? Like you're asking children to conceptualize an idea that is so beyond their brains, their brains that at like 25, I was like, Ooh, so you're going to ask a five-year-old. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure for a kiddo when they should just learn to live, just be. And that doesn't mean we don't have like guardrails of rules to keep them safe and all the things because their little brains mm -hmm. literally just need it. But it just means that Whatever that looks like. Timmy, if you want to wear a tutu today because you want to be a ballerina, rock on, my dude. And then tomorrow you want to work with the excavator. Okay, go. Like, I don't actually care. But as long as you're in that space of, like, joy. Mm -hmm. Be we, in joy. Whatever that looks like. Yeah. We steal that from kids because we're just asking them to work in confines that, like, actually don't make sense. Like, I'm picturing Nash. Even, like... I, can't, I couldn't even imagine he just wants to be a ninja really right now well like the reality of it is if you're if you're at home um you know and your parents aren't letting you put on a tutu that is not going to change anything at the school like that sounds terrible but you know the reality of it is I think the biggest thing we can do is create a space for kids to authentically show up a hundred percent and that's the conversation I believe we all need to have in, in our lives is like you can override the the parenting you can override it but what you can do is create a conduit of a space of like hey show up as you you know if we want to use more gender neutral terms fine and if you want to do that in your classroom so it just kind of is all encompassing right you say you pe say people's names instead of you know like that's something i think that you can always be mindful of because it just can be a nice change up instead of always gendering everything but ultimately like just encourage kids to be them like be present we're happy to have you we see you you bring joy you bring value and like and stop trying to um put adult context on it and a kid will tell you if you create a safe enough space that they want to be there they'll tell you and if they don't tell you they'll tell you in the wrong way so for me that was like being angry and pushing against everything that was told to me so like I think ultimately, like, we all just want to be see seen and heard and like giving them tools to be like, hey, I can like show up and like, I can be happy. I don't want to be embarrassed that I'm happy. I don't be comfortable to be unhappy. Like, just mm -hmm. understand those confines. Because um, I think kids will tell you. And if your parents are, aren't going to be super supportive at home, I will tell you, we'll not override it. We will oh. never override it. It might give them a safe space, but we'll never override mm -hmm. that feeling until they leave the home. And the plot's been lost, in my opinion. So like we say the other side being like, we are not allowing children to have choice if they are different, right? A very small population in the world don't identify with their physical biological. Kind of, or biological sex. Their gender is different. It's not aligned. It's not affirming. That's okay. That's a small population of that world. And you have that conver conversation with that child. But instead of just saying that small percent and not to say I agree with 
being really rigid. We've swung the other direction to be not so rigid, but now rigid within different confines. So now you must tell me. It's also an election and a choice. As right. So it's like, just me. we've just gone the other direction of like forcing children to like make a choice. And again, like I think of, I have a, we have a nephew who's five and calls Megan Auntie Pickles. Like he just is like this really, like it's an impressionable mind either way. I can definitely understand this like very rigid left-sided kind of understanding. I get it that they have these like tiny brains that are just like learning and evolving. And because you played Bat Cave in the garage and you were Captain Pickles, you are now just anti Pickles. That's just how that is. So I think it's just a, to me is like a, a metaphor to going like that little brain is just looking to operate in the world. So, like, stop putting such harsh restrictions around, like, how it has to be, and instead yeah. just let it be. Right? Yeah. We, we have enough social. Yeah, because I wonder if either way, you're like you said, you're putting them in boxes, and you guys, your experiences, like your actual lived experiences, is, is getting out of these boxes is difficult. Anyways, let's not place more boxes on kids, because man, they're hard to get out of. Yeah, right? well, they get comfy. We actually, right? Crave, right? We actually crave it. So, to me, it's like I don't know the right answer. I don't think any of us will, but I think sometimes we swing too hard either way, instead of just saying like, what do we value as, you know, let's education, what are our core values? Like, like, why don't we just have that conversation? Oh, we want to create authentic children. We want to support them. We want to help them emotionally regulate. We want to encourage them to use their brains, to grow, to evolve, to challenge themselves, to reach their potential, whether that be, you know, Einstein or down here, but making sure that they, they have the capacity to feel supported. So like, to me, that's how the decisions would be made. It doesn't mean that you have to go around and say, Hey, now check, check. Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not saying eventually there's different conversations as kids get older and respect and, you know, how do we make sure people mm -hmm. feel respected in this space, but electing something like before I, if someone came around and asked me that question, I mean, I'm obviously not part of that community. Um, I, you know, identify as female. I was born you know, biologically as, you know, a female, but I wouldn't have been like, yeah, just because I've had an encounter did not mean I was checking a box that I was gay. So like, I just think at the end of the day, you like the, the goal is like, how do I encourage myself to be okay? Whether I can check the box or not check the box. Like, how do I be okay? That's, that's the goal. The yeah. fucking box can move away. But like, how yeah. do I be okay? Cause you can check a box, say I'm gay and I could still be miserable. I'd be like, shit, this sucks. I hate my life. Mm -hmm. so I better figure out how to how to be happy I better figure out how to be me or you feel like that's what you're stuck to forever you can go either way yes that's what, that's what Megan just said they get comfortable you get comfortable there they're hard to get out of yeah absolutely yeah Good. like let the kids just be it's just even as adults it's a hard thing it's a really tough thing and, it's, and I, get, I get where I don't think it's coming from a bad place at all oh. I think trying to create inclusivity which is amazing but um mm -hmm by trying to make inclusive movements we are actually creating more alienation in my opinion but because i think we're yes. just slapping a name tag on people that just goes like why is it needed yeah. me introducing myself here and i'm gay yeah it goes back to your original question that dana said like would you tell your five-year-old self be joyful find joy be in your joy be your wiggly self yeah but think you're there you'll uh -huh. find it whatever that is for you like you wouldn't mm -hmm. go into like, we wouldn't take on a client or go into session and be like, hey, ask us like super traumatic question, just like off the hop, you know, the, maybe know the kid's first name and then be like, so tell me about that time that was like super traumatic. And the reason why you're in this room, they'd be like, uh, I'm going to go. Like, well, oh, it's not going to hide you. And then yeah, just going to like wall up and say, cool. So are you really here. getting the authentic answers? Probably not. So you can put it, you can put it in place, but I don't think you're creating a space for kids. Especially five-year-olds. I think that's a different conversation. My mom was a kindergarten teacher for many, many years. Um, I volunteered in a kindergarten room. It is like herding cats. It is, it is exhausting. I would never be a kindergarten teacher. No. Um, she's a fantastic teacher and she like would come home from school and just be exhausted you are on all the time and they want to sing the Sega song and they want their free time. And like, like, I just think that there's so much joy that comes with sitting with, with kids that like, they're not actually adults. Like, I think we work our whole lives to go back to our childlike self. Like we forget and we're like, Hey, like maybe I can get back there. It's been a really long time and work super hard to like, just be there. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think we have to make them grow up. I just think we have to find a space to genuinely love and support them. And if we can't do that, mm -hmm. I think that we're losses to society regardless. So um, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well said. you guys need to run for all the politics. I got you at my vote. <laughs> <laughs> There's no party that I uh, <laughs> would align with. I know. Been in the mucky middle for a long time and there's no one there. I'm with you. I'm there. Yeah, I know. There's no, they're too extreme. All too extreme for sure. Yeah. Amazing. I have a thousand more questions, but I know we're out of time. So any last minute, any final thoughts, wishes, dreams you want to share with the audience? I know. I just want to say this has been amazing. You guys are amazing. And I think the gems you have said, like people can go back and re-listen to this and pull out the gems because there are so many gems of wisdom for relationship, mm -hmm. for authenticity, for just being your authentic, wiggly, messy self for being in tune with your body. Like there's so many gems that you guys have said here today. They're so brilliant. So thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've always talked about wanting to do a podcast. So I think this is, this is super fun. So I know that we come from two very, not very different stories, but we have stories to share, whether that's like being an elite performance athletes, going to college, coming out, not coming out, being married, coaching together, being a part of all these yeah. like little pockets of things that, you know, we've had to work really hard to kind of find space in. I'm super proud of us. And I know that that space is interesting and new and not aligned with a lot of people. Like, I don't say, I wouldn't say that a lot of people do what we do and not to say that we're like weirdly unique and deserve a medal for it, but to walk into newly married coach together, we basically run an association in its own little pockets. Um, we do a lot. And I'm really proud. I have high achieving jobs and school, and you guys are like in the occasionally, world. occasionally we have a date night, not very often. Yeah, um, yeah. I just because sometimes you like if you're like 16 years old and you're like look at them, you're like oh like ourselves, you know. It's like okay, that's great. Oh my gosh, it all worked out for you. Um, it doesn't. It like looks really beautiful. It looks like great. Like our wedding photos are fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. My wife is beautiful. We have a beautiful dog. Um, and like you know my life blew up when my relationship last ended like we've just we've had a lot of stuff happen on the way and we forget sometimes like as much as we can't go into a ton of detail on everything today that there's a lot of heartbreak and a lot of tears and a lot of anger and there's you know I was angry last week and I had to be like why am I so fucking angry like I gotta get through this so sometimes we forget like when we're feeling alone that like hey like I'm just never gonna get that I'm never gonna get get my happiness um and I for sure believe that for good chunk of my life right and there's still moments and days where you go back to that like negative self-talk or like shit like I don't deserve this or I don't deserve to be happy so like don't forget like we're you know like this is just like you know a nice picture it's like Instagram right like, there's actually a lot of shit in between um you know it's when you're having a hard time if you're part of the community or you're like trying to figure that out is like you might get your happy ending you have to believe in that but you got to be willing to take the steps and like sit with yourself enough to not lose hope and faith right that's our that's our goal is never lose hope yeah yeah and you like said every step of the way you're doing the work you're pausing you're in it you're like pause what i gotta do you're doing the work all the way through yeah. authenticity is work is a is a journey mm -hmm. and to balance right life is not it's not easy i don't think it's no. at some points well, i don't think that the, the toughest moments i've had are probably the most beautiful ones i can lean into I think that's to go along with that thing. Like, just know that it's hard work. And move your body. Oh God, yeah, do that. Move your body because it will tell you if you're having a hard time. That's really important. It's your easiest thing to do for yourself. Go for yeah. a walk and play. I'm not as good as it, and she is. But that's the my child self is hard. That's a that's one I've locked away. So we work on that. That's my chapter. But play. Well, I do things. Do pickles. Isn't it? So he pickles, right? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you both for coming on our podcast. You're a, a both beautiful souls and I've loved interviewing and hearing your stories and seriously have a lot of gems. Like Alicia said that you, that you guys have even taught me that I'm like, I've never thought of it that way. So, so appreciate both of you and thank you for coming on. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thanks guys. Thanks so much for joining us. We're really glad you're here with us on this journey. The best way to support this podcast is to subscribe and give it a five-star review. See you next time.
This has been a Bread Dog Studios production.